Thank you, everybody. Th thank you, Rabbi. You, uh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, also, um, special thanks to uh, Russell Hoffman and Amanda Clad, who did a tremendous amount of work in terms of um, uh, preparing for this and the sessions you had uh, y you had yesterday. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We're okay. Okay. Good. So, what I'm going to do? I'm supposed to speak. Uh, actually, you gave me a nice amount of time. Um, I'm going to I'm going to share with you some hopefully some practical thoughts on Jewish perspectives and psychological perspectives on happiness and then gratitude in light of uh, Thanksgiving uh, coming up tomorrow. It's going to be informed by my almost 40 years of experience specializing in working with adolescents going through tough times in their lives. So my specialty over the years has been uh, first as director of psychology in a large hospital system. Our research specialty and our clinical specialty was in working with victims of abuse, working with um, survivors of various kinds of trauma and illness. Um, and then um, through that, traveling to different parts of the world after traumatic events. So I was in Sri Lanka after this tsunami working there for a while, trying to help um, by working with the doctors about the recovery there after the tsunami. I've often worked with colleagues in, um, in Israel after terror attacks. And um, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be hopefully practical, but illustrated with stories. Because I know um, that stories are the best way of speaking to your right hemispheres, of, of not just boring you with facts, but talking about real life experience. So let me start first in terms of talking about happiness. Um, let me contrast the secular view of happiness versus the concept of simcha. So let me, let's first talk about the secular view of happiness. Happiness is rooted in the following concept. Think about words that start with the prefix of H-A-P. Hapless, ha haphazard, happenstance. You see a theme there? Anybody want to take a guess at what um, H-A-P might work, might mean? So it's a prefix that means sort of like luck. If you're lucky enough to be born into the right circumstances, you're going to be happy. That's kind of the American dream. What do you think the average American answers when you ask him or her what it takes to be happy? Anybody want to guess? Money, right. Money, money, right. That's what the average American will answer. And that's in very sharp contrast to what the, um, what the Jewish concept of simcha is. And, and one of the ways I want to talk about it, before I talk a little bit about the money-happiness connection, is let me illustrate. I'm going to give you a double enigma. Here's enigma number one. Um, for the last 25 plus years, I've been privileged to volunteer as the uh, visiting um, psychologists in residence every year at the High Lifeline Retreat, retreat for families of kids with various kinds of uh, challenging chronic uh, illnesses. And it's always the high point Shabbos of my, of my uh, year. And one of the early retreats, we're sitting around in a circle, and it's a whole array of people. It ranges from, from um, uh, parents of children with uh, chronic illness who um, are intermarried to Satmar Hasidim. And at this point, all of the parents are really have bonded with each other. It doesn't matter what your background is, is they have the commonality of a sick child. And we're having a discussion Shabbos afternoon and Asamar Chassid says the following. He says, you know, this last Rosh Hashanah, my 16-year-old son was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And 10 days later on Yom Kippur, I was sitting in shul, davening, and a wave of happiness washed over me like I've never experienced in my entire life. To me, it was very strange. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was sort of looking puzzled. But then I see all the other parents are nodding in agreement with tears in their eyes. He was talking about simcha. 
But how could that be? How could you experience one of the highest levels of happiness in your life 10 days after such a life transforming experience? Enigma number two, you may have read. It's a section in the book Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl's book about his experiences in the concentration camp as he was developing logotherapy and talking about search for meaning. I imagine that at some point it's a book that you guys have read and if not, read it. Um, and he has this amazing scene. He's a physician. He's a, psych he's a psychiatrist, but he gets assigned to the typhus ward in the camp that he was in. And he's caring for a young woman, maybe a year or two older than you guys are. And as he's caring for her, she calls him over. It's the last minute of her life, literally the last minute of her life. And she says, you know, Dr. Frankel, until I came into this horrible place, I was a frivolous teenager. I didn't know what was important. I was living a life that was vapid and superficial and meaningless. And she's looking up through the slats in the roof in the typhus ward. And she's seeing the clouds and the beautiful blue sky. And she says, you know, Dr. Frankel, as I'm looking up now at God's beautiful world and the beauty of nature and feeling a connection to something greater than myself, I'm happier than I've ever been. And she closes her eyes and dies. So that's a double enigma. Both of those vignettes are stories of simcha and not tied to our conventional understanding of happiness. Let's explore the secular view of happiness just for a minute. I won't bore you with a lot of statistics except to tell you having money doesn't hurt. Okay, you could be poor and happy, you could be rich and happy. It's just that it's irrelevant. Money is irrelevant to happiness once your basic needs are met. Once your basic needs are met, pretty much there's no way to predict um, if you're going to be happy or not happy based on knowing what a person's bank account is. And this is based on hundreds and hundreds of studies around the world. Okay? Um, I'll tell you my favorite story about it. It's the story of Robert Frank. Robert Frank He's a wealthy guy today. He's a well-known economist, author. He has money. He lives a life of privilege. But he was an idealistic guy. When he got out of college, he volunteered for the Peace Corps, which at that time was what a lot of idealistic people did after college, to volunteer his time to do chesed for two years. You don't get to choose where you would go in the Peace Corps. And they fly him to Nepal. A van picks him up in Nepal, takes him on like a 12-hour drive to the middle of the country, a dirt poor area of the country, and they drop him off, and they say, we'll pick you up in two years. And they show him where he's going to be living. He's going to spend the next two years living in a one-room hut with no running water and no electricity. So he's in a state of total despair. He's telling himself, how could I possibly survive living in a one-room hut with no running water and no electricity, but he said it was the strangest thing. He got used to it. He said within two, three days, he was totally okay with it because nobody in that area of Nepal was living in any better conditions. Okay, it's called relative deprivation. We pretty much compare ourselves to those around us. And it's, the problem is, is when somebody has a lot more, okay, that's when we feel bad. That's when we feel terrible about it. Okay. So here's where the story gets interesting. He gets his first paycheck. It's a monthly paycheck, and he discovers that he's going to be making $30 a month. OK? I, I practice in uh, Long Island, where if a kid got $30 a week for allowance, he probably he or she would probably call their parents to report them for child abuse, OK? Um, this is $30 a month that he was getting, $30 a month. And he says to himself, that's it. I'm going, I have to figure out a way to get back home. I can't survive on $30 a month. But listen to what happens. He discovers pretty quickly that nobody in that part of Nepal is making any more 
than $20 a month. So he's making $10 more a month than anybody else. And he goes on to say that he never felt wealthier in his life than he did living on $30 a month in a one-room hut with no water and no electricity. That's what Shlomo Melch says, right? Ohev kesef, lo yispa kesef. You know, I once had a guy come to my office. He was uh, working in a uh, Wall Street financial um, uh, firm. He was making an enormous amount of money. He came in. It was uh, the end of December. It was uh, bonus time. And he was clinically depressed. He hadn't slept, he hadn't eaten, he couldn't concentrate. He literally was in a clinical depression. So I asked him what was going on. He said, I got my bonus. And he's crying. This is through his tears. And I said, well, okay, tell me a little bit about it. He said, well, it was um, $750,000. So I said, and you're sad, why? And he said, the guy in the office next to me, he's nowhere near as good as me. And he got a million dollar bonus. He says, I just can't go on. How could I go on knowing I'm living in such a cruel, unfair world? If we tie our feelings of subjective well-being to how much we have, we're always going to be subject to that kind of false sense of self and security. Because there's no connection whatsoever. Again, you need to have your basic needs met. And that's different definitions for different people. But we know the answer is not the money happiness connection. So what is the answer? And what's the answer to the double enigma? OK? Because we know it's actually, there used to be an ad that says that it would show a picture of a Lexus. It was an ad for a Lexus. And the tagline was, um, you know, anybody who says money can't buy happiness isn't spending it right. Another example of sort of like some of the false values. Let's look at Simcha and let's look at the answer to the, um, to the double enigma question. The Chazon Ish says it beautifully. Here's what he says. He says, for he who knows the light of truth, there is no sadness in the world. Happiness comes, or simcha, comes from the connection to the truth, to the enduring truth that you connect to. The truth of being connected to the essence of who you really are. And research study after research study shows that what happiness is connected to in an enduring kind of way is the three F's, okay? F number one is family. F number two is friends. Anybody want to guess what the third F is? What's that? Fun. I like that. Fun. Yeah, who said faith? It's very rare for people to get it. Excellent. Faith. Usually when I speak to um, adolescents about this topic, the girls often will call out food, which I find to be interesting, and the boys smile. Okay? But, um, but... Uh, um, the, the, it's family, friends, and faith. Family, friends, and faith. And that's pretty, that's pretty consistent. Pretty consistent, okay? In study after study after study. So what's the answer to the, um, what's the answer to the double enigma? The Samar Chassid had the wave of happiness washing over him because on that Yom Kippur, he was surrounded by all of the ingredients of Simcha. Okay? He was surrounded in shul 10 days after his son's scary diagnosis with family, friends, and his faith. He was surrounded by the enduring truths of the world. Okay? A colleague of mine once suggested the word simcha comes from the word shum moach. It's where your head is connected to. If your head is connected to enduring truth, it makes all the difference in the world, okay? And that's where that chassid's head was connected to at that moment. Same thing with that young woman in the concentration camp in the last minute of her life. As she was looking up and connecting to the transcendent, she experienced simcha. She experienced the enduring realities of, of, of that truth. Now, part of that 
is about being connected to yourself. So let me, let me read to you a very brief paragraph, then a thought from Riff Cook, and then I'll move on to, to the second part. Here's the, um, here's the first paragraph. This is from Dr. Akiva Tatz. Have any of you read the works of Dr. Tatz here? Are you familiar with him? He's a brilliant, brilliant, uh, he's a surgeon who then became a Balshuva and does amazing writings on the topic we're talking about. Um, if you get a chance to read, I've had the privilege of um, speaking together with him, of being on, on the same program at Jewish Medical Ethics Conference. Actually, in a couple of months, I'll be spending a week with him. And I, I, I'm always amazed by the brilliance of his thinking. Here's what he says about happiness at your age. Real happiness is what you experience when you're doing what you should be doing. When you're moving clearly along your own road, your unique path to your unique destination, that's when you experience real happiness, a real simcha. When you're moving along the path that leads to yourself, to the deep discovery of who you really are, when you're building the essence of your own personality and creating yourself, a deep happiness wells up within you. The journey does not cause happiness. The journey is the happiness itself. But for everybody in this room, and this is a large group here of your wonderful student body, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be the nigun miyuchad, the unique melody of your own souls. Listen to where of Cook says. And, and here, if you don't listen to anything else I say this morning, listen to this. Here's what he says. Because it's the key to simcha as opposed to happiness. Yesh ben chorin sherucho ruach shel eved. V'yesh eved sherucho malayacheris. And boy, do I see this in my practice as a clinical psychologist on a regular basis. Here's what he says. There are free people who have the spirit of a slave. I have in my practice billionaires. I have in my practice incredibly wealthy people from the north shore of Long Island, Gold Coast, Sands Point, and some incredibly wealthy areas. Chairman of the board of many of the Fortune 500 companies living not too far from where my practice is. And some of them are the unhappiest people I know. Some of them I've been seeing on and off for years. And then I have some people in my practice who come from incredibly challenging kind of lives. And some of them are among the happiest people I know. I'm going to end with a story about that. So, Yesh ben Choren Sherucha Ruach Shaleved, okay? V'yesh Eved Sherucha Mleacheris. Listen to what he says is the key, Riv Cook. Hanemon Laatzmi Yuso ben Choren Hu. If you figure out a way to be faithful to your inner essence, to the uniqueness of who you are, okay? Not dependent on what others think of you, not dependent on impression management and making superficial kinds of decisions about your life. That person is always going to be free. And anybody whose entire life is all about worrying about what will others think of me? How am I on social media? Am I in? Am I out? What, do, what, what decisions will I make in terms of the superficial? Who have it? You're going to live a life of slavery and a life that will get you away from the inner simcha of true discovery and true meaning and true purpose. So that's the end of part one. We're good? Okay? Okay, let's move on. wanted to... Um, move on to talking a little bit, a um, little bit about, about gratitude. Because gratitude is what tomorrow's holiday is all about. It's what Thanksgiving is all about. But it's also what being a Jew is all about. I'm sure many of you, many of you are aware that the Hebrew word Yehudi is grounded in what? What concept? The concept of Hakara Satov, the concept of gratitude, right? Leah has her fourth child. She names him Yehuda, because Hapam Oda es Hashem, thanking God for getting more than what her fair share would have been by rights. And that's not just a, um, 
an interesting little tidbit from Jewish thinking and from the Chumash. It's literally a, a, a core gratitude that is very grounded in recent research in positive psychology. Here's what the research in positive psychology finds. To the extent that you could build gratitude into your life, you're going to be happier. You're not only going to be happier, but you're going to be basically going to be in a place where, first of all, other people are going to be more anxious to do things for you. If you don't show a real gratitude to somebody, they're going to stop doing anything for you. But the problem with gratitude is that it's very hard to keep going in your life. We tend to be most grateful to strangers who help us and least grateful to those we owe the most to. Most people have a hard time maintaining gratitude to their closest friends, to their mothers, to their fathers, to their siblings, to the people who literally are nourishing them the most because we get used to everything. You get used to the most incredible things. So the question is, how do you overcome that? And what are some recommendations for bringing happiness and gratitude into your life? I'll give you an example. One of the um, research um, pieces in positive psychology finds the following, and it's interesting. I was speaking in Chicago the um, weekend before last, and in a Friday night talk, I shared this with a group of, I don't know, about 500 people, and people came to me the next morning and said they tried what I'm about to tell you that night, and one older woman said it was the first good night's sleep she had in years and years and years. So if you want to, you could try this, or it could be that you guys have no trouble sleeping whatsoever. So, but for those of you who might be looking to improve your sleep, it's, it's a deceptively simple practice tied to gratitude. Here's, here's what, what the um, researchers show. The research shows that if you could develop, if you're having trouble falling asleep, a way of getting your pre-sleep cognitions to be about, let's say, three things in your life you're really grateful for, okay? Meaning, before you're going to sleep, you have in your head a thought about, it could be an old memory of three things that were really unbelievably um, amazing memories. It could have been a best, the best day you ever had with friends or with, um, with your family, or it could have been a vacation. It could be an amazing event. And you get three images in your head, and you mull over it a little bit before you go to sleep. Or it could be three things from your week that you're grateful for. When you do that, here's what the research shows happens. Three things will happen. You'll fall asleep more quickly, you'll sleep more deeply, and you'll feel more rested the next day. Try it. It's part of the power, the power of gratitude, the power of Hakara Satov. But the question is, in terms of happiness and in terms of gratitude, how do you overcome the habituation that I was talking about? You know, I was once um, um, went to Hawaii. Um, our research team, um, I was at NYU Medical School. Our research team um, had a paper accepted at a child and adolescent psychiatry conference in Hawaii, and I volunteered to go give the paper. I was feeling very generous. So I get an expense paid trip to Hawaii, and I cut a session because it was just so beautiful where the conference was. And I'm sitting outside all alone, and I'm looking at this unbelievable scene. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Hawaii. There was a moon bow. The moon was so bright, there was like a rainbow over the moon. There was a waterfall in the distance. It was breathtaking, unbelievable beauty. You know, when you, when you appreciate something so much, it's hard not to share it. Sharing things you're grateful for makes it much more powerful. So I turn to the only person around who was a hotel worker, and I say, wow. I can't even imagine how lucky you must feel to be able to be working in a place of such unbelievable beauty. He sort of comes out of his days and he looks at me and he says in a very polite way, he says, sir, I don't see what you're saying. I really don't know what you're talking about. He said, I dread going to work Monday morning as much as the next guy, okay? That's the challenge. The challenge is how do you overcome that? Because if you could build in that gratitude into your daily life, your health improves, your happiness improves. 
And again, that's the challenge of, of what we're talking about. So I'm going to make a couple of recommendations. I'm going to illustrate them with stories, and that'll get us to the end. So the first recommendation for anything we're talking about is the only way you could overcome herigal, you could overcome habituation, is you have to build it, you have to ritualize it. You have to build it into your life. That's what Thanksgiving is about. Once a year, you take a step back and you think about what you're grateful for. And if you do tefillah right to a certain extent, it's a, it's a chance sometimes to at least think a little bit about what you're grateful for. And there are many times that you could build into the fabric of your life just to step back to think what you're grateful for. For example, many people have a count your blessing exercise where you go around the table on Friday night and every member of the family or your company shares one thing from the previous week they're grateful for. One of my kids with my grandchildren at Havdullah, they go around and they talk about something in the previous week they're grateful for, and then talk about what they're looking forward to in the next week. And it does two things. It shares an important part of your life with your family, which helps promote closeness, but it also, in all the research, it promotes a higher level of happiness. It may make you a little nauseous to think about it. It's not developmentally what your age is about, but to the extent that you could push yourself to do it, it makes an enormous difference. And that's one recommendation. A second recommendation, which I'll say, and then I'm going to end with two stories. That'll get us to uh, the, the 10.50 end time. The second practical recommendation that's associated with higher levels of happiness, there are many, okay? The book that was just talked about, but there are many books and many research studies to talk about it, has to do with getting in touch with your goals. Probably the biggest enemy of happiness, and I'm not saying this in a super negative way, I noticed that about 90% of you were listening well to me. There's another 10% that's not really in this room, okay? Another 10% that are looking down, not looking up. The research shows the more you're pulled into social media in a passive way, the more you're pulled into looking down as opposed to looking up, the more your sadness levels will go up for a variety of reasons. It pulls you into not non-genuine kind of, kind of connection. And if you think about it for yourself, when I teach this stuff in our doctoral program and I give assignments and I have people track when are you feeling happy? What are you doing? What are you doing throughout the day? When are you happiest when you're least happy? People are amazed at how this is a wonderful, wonderful device and it's associated with incredible stuff. But if you get pulled away from who you are, you can't be in a place where you discover who you are and where you're going because that's the key to happiness. The research shows the following. I'm not going to ask you to do this, but it's an interesting thing to think about. If I asked you guys now, to spend 20 minutes, write about where do you see yourself 10 years from now. You imagine the best possible outcome for yourself 10 years from now, professionally, personally, and you don't censor yourself, and, and nobody else is going to read it. So you write an essay, of just writing, writing, writing 20 minutes, and then you did that for three more days. What would happen to your mood Actually, it's two things will happen. Your happiness levels will shoot up because you're getting in touch with yourself probably for a couple of months if you, do, if you really do it. And it'll make it more likely you'll realize those goals. Michael Josephson, the head for the Center of Ethics, said the following. Here's how you have to live your life. He says, imagine you're a fly on the wall at your own funeral. So you're dead. In 120 years, you're dead. And you're being eulogized and you're thinking about how do you want to be eulogized after your long, wonderful life? He said, think about the three things that you want your eulogizer to say about you, and then live life backwards. Live life backwards. But ain chazon yifara'am, it says in Mishle. Without that vision thing, you sort of fall away from yourself, and you drift away. But we talked about counting your blessings, so here's my two concluding stories. Story number one is at a High Lifeline retreat a number of years ago, the guy gets on the stage, gets on the Bema Shabbos for the Shabbos speech. 
I never seen him before, and I'm sitting next to a very prominent doctor from Sloan Kettering Memorial, who I know very well. We've been together at the retreats for the last number of years. This big, strong-looking guy who's introduced as a physician gets up, and he tells his story. Listen to his story. And I remember when it happened. Many years ago, Camp Simcha used to be co-ed. And there were two 18-year-olds, a boy and a girl, who were very seriously ill. And their prognosis was not great. Nobody expected them to live much longer. And they fell in love. And I remember they wanted to get married, they wanted to get engaged, and there was a lot of discussion about it by various professionals consulting to the organization. We know this is going to end badly. Could we allow them to get married? Or should we let them get married and squeeze out whatever little happiness they could have in their dwindling days ahead? And I remember everybody, I think, wisely said, let them get married. He lives in another part of the world in another hemisphere. They get engaged. It was a tremendous simcha. He hops on a plane, flies back to his country. And the second he lands, this was before cell phones, they announce on the PA system of the airport that he has to report immediately to the front desk of the airline. They say, bad news, your fiance um, is requesting that you come back home immediately. And they arranged a phone call for him, and, and the doctor, the guy who was sitting next to me at this uh, speech, says, come home. She wants to say goodbye to you. Forget about the wedding. Just come home and say goodbye. We're going to try to keep her alive till you get home. She's taken a turn for the worse. So he rushes back on the plane, lands at JFK, quickly rushes to the hospital, and he runs into her room in the ICU at the hospital, and the first thing that hits him is the spark of uniqueness in her eyes is gone. He fell in love with not just her beauty, he fell in love with the uniqueness of her soul that he saw in her face and in her eyes. It was gone. She was so sick, something called a cushionoid look from high levels of steroid. It was gone. Sort of it almost looked like her soul was gone. And he's beyond upset. He quickly runs to the payphone, and he calls his rabbi. He says, Rabbi, come, rush, rush, come right away, marry us, get us married. The rabbi rushes. He goes to the hospital in Manhattan, and he talks to her for a while. He says, I'd love to marry you, but she's not a bardas. She's not, she's not, she's not, she's not, um, she's not rational enough. It wouldn't be a real marriage. Let's wait till she's rational enough to marry her, but it will not be a real marriage. So now he's really destroyed. And the doctor who's sitting next to me, as he's giving this speech, goes over to him and says, look, say goodbye to her, you know? It's time. We've done everything we could. Just say goodbye to her. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to arrange for this part of the ICU to be for you alone. It'll be totally um, private. And he basically thinks to himself, you know, I didn't daven yet. He was a pretty observant guy. And he thinks to himself, look, I'm about to daven. And I'm about to say Shimon Esrei. What's one thing? He says, look, I know I can't even daven for her to get better. It's not going to happen. Right? He says, you know what I'd like? If for even one minute, the beauty and uniqueness of her, of her eyes, of her soul could come back to me, Maybe I could come to terms with his tragedy. So he starts davening Shimon Esrei. And in the Sim Shalom, he comes up to the following phrase. Kulanu ke'echad ba'ar panecha. God, just give me one minute of the uniqueness of her soul. One minute of bringing back the woman I fell in love with. I could come to terms with it. As he's saying this, the doctor whispers in my ear, what you're about to hear I have no medical explanation for. He says, I'm a man of science. I can't explain what happened next. And as the doctor is about to go on in his speech, suddenly two little kids, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, come running up onto the bima at this hotel that the retreat is at and start saying, Abba, Abba. And the doctor says, that's, that's their children. Because after that feel, and I'm not talking about miracle healing. I'm not, this isn't about that. It's about uniqueness and gratitude for uniqueness. Because at that point, for whatever reasons, reasons 
I'll never understand. The doctor, a man of science, will never understand. She turned. She turned. And they got better. She got better. And he got better. I don't think you could call it a cure. They're always living on that sword, you know, of not being sure if there might be a relapse. But guess what? He got well enough to go to medical school to become an amazing physician. She got well enough to be able to pursue her career plans. I've met them both. They're amazing people. They're amazing people. But that's what we have to bring into our lives an understanding of how to develop our own uniqueness and our appreciation for the uniqueness of those who are closest to. And here's my concluding story. I do a lot of work in different areas because of, um, because of my specialty in trauma. So as part of this, I've been invited for a number of years to a conference in Frankfurt, Germany, paid for by the companies that benefited from slave labor. And they asked me to speak to um, the um, remaining survivors of the Holocaust in Europe. And it's an amazing three days. Because I get to do groups, and I get to give talks, and I get to connect with an amazing, amazing group of wise people, and to learn a tremendous amount from them. Because sometimes happiness comes out of the least expected places. Because Simcha is about connection. So I'm going to end with this story. Last time I went to the conference, there was a man who was the happiest man I ever met in my life, ever. I had never been up against such joy and such Simcha Sachayim. He was so happy, everybody wanted to be around him. He, there was something about him that exuded joy, ex exuded Simcha. And it's the last day of the conference. He's an older man. I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to see him again. So I get my courage up. I don't want to be disrespectful. I go over to him. I say, you know, there's a Jewish saying, ma'at min ha'ar. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ma'at min ha'ar docha harbe min Little sparks of light push away a great deal of darkness. I said, what's your spark of light? You told us in the groups how much you suffered. Where does your joy come from? You'd have every excuse to be depressed. You'd have every excuse to have given up on life. And here you are so joyful that everybody wants to be around you to sort of like be impacted by your optimism. And he looked a little embarrassed. He's a very articulate man, and he reviews with me the horrible things that happened to him when he was exactly your age. It's about 14, 15, 16 in the camps. And he talked about being called out at roll call at 3, 4 in the morning. You've all heard the stories. If you go too slow, they put the dogs on you to devour you. If you fall down, you're machine gunned. And he said, you want to know what got me through? You want to know what got me through? He said, I developed the ability to feel the warmth of my father's hands on my head when he benched me every Friday night, when he gave me a bracha every Friday night, and to smell the sweetness of his breath when he bent down to kiss me. He says, you want to know what got me through? It was that. It was that bracha. About a year later, and with this I'll truly end, it'll get us in exactly on time, about a year later, I was in South Africa. And I was giving a talk, and for whatever reason, I gave a talk about, um, that ended with the story I just told you. And in the audience, there was a man I didn't know was a survivor, but it was a man who I'd spent a lot of time in his house in my time in South Africa. He lives in a huge, huge, magnificent mansion he um, has a car collection that's world-renowned, okay? Famous car collection. He showed me around, you know, uh, to show me his cars. He has grounds that are unbelievable, and he's one of the wealthiest men in that part of the world, in, in, in Africa. And he had a lot of events in his house, because I was there to do some activism work with child abuse there and with uh, some other initiatives the chief rabbi had started in South Africa and it was uh, his house was the place that we had a lot of events so I got to know him a little bit he comes over to me crying after I ended my talk with the story of the bracha and he says David he says I don't know if you know but I'm a survivor I hadn't known he was a survivor he said you want to know what you got me in touch with with that story he said, you saw what I have. You saw my cars. 
You saw my grounds, you saw my house, you know my business. He said, I would give it all up, everything, all up. He said, I'm not going to be a pig about it. Just for the chance of once, just once, to walk to Shoal, holding my father's hand on one side, my mother's hand on the other side. Just once, just once, I'd give up everything I had and I could then die a happy man. That's what we have to hold on to. We have to hold on to what matters. What matters? What matters is the light of truth. What matters is the connection to yourself. The connection to Hanemon Laatz Miyuso, being true to your inner self. That's the key. That's the key. And again, going into the spirit of Thanksgiving, may we all be privileged to have those true connections to yourself and to family, friends, and faith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.